Welcome everyone to my podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. I invite you to take a journey with me into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties us directly to the natural world around us. My intention is to be your guide for this half hour as we begin seeing our world with fresh eyes, gaining more understanding and learning how we can connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature is in us. I feature a broad range of guests deeply concerned about the environmental issues of our time and more, authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth and for all species help us create sustainable bridges of understanding. These folks are innovators, action-oriented, creating solutions in a variety of ways that honor us and the planet's holistic nature. I am so honored to share their stories, their projects, and their passion with all of you. So thank you for joining me today for another engaging interview. And today I am so delighted to introduce you to Michael Judd, who is the author of Edible Landscaping with a Permaculture Twist, and he has worked with agroecological and whole system designs throughout the Americas for nearly two decades, focusing on applying permaculture and ecological design. His projects increase local food security and community health in both tropical and temperate growing regions. He is the founder of Ecologia Edible and Ecological Landscape Design and Project Bonafide, an international non-project supporting agroecology research. Welcome, Michael, to The Holistic Nature of Us. Great. It's good to be here. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, tell us about yourself. Uh, I know you have so much experience in ecological holistic design, and that seems to be an area where we're we're finding great concern because we can do so much as local landowners. Yes, I know. I was listening to that um, intro. You know, my bio. There's there's a lot to unpack there and uh, kind of bring bring back to earth, so to say. And yes, there is so much needed right now. And and but how do we make it practical? Uh, you know, what can we do in our yards and in our landscapes uh, that feed us, but then also, you know, cycle the needs for wildlife, uh, for our local watershed? And this is where I look to when I design. How do we stack these functions uh, so that things look good? which is important in a lot of landscapes, but then are productive and support the ecologies around us. Um, and that's that's kind of what I brought into my first book, uh, oh, Edible yeah. Landscaping. And your first book is, I have to tell the listeners, it's beautifully designed. The pictures are gorgeous. So you get a real sense of the tips and your advice in very practical ways in the edible landscaping book yeah i'm i'm big on how to uh, sort of short on the philosophy and then like okay so what does this look like um you know when you go out in your yard and you're looking at the the sea of grass and and you've got all these head head full of ideas but like where do i begin and i like to break it down so as an example let's say you want to plant a fruit tree and instead of going out there and digging a you know a, a hole for it in the middle of the lawn and maybe giving it a you know a foot or two of mulch, think about how you could set up a sort of a guild, a companion planting patch, if you will, where where that tree is going to be planted with something that helps fix nitrogen, something that helps draw in pollinators, something that helps create a living mulch. Uh, so this becomes what we call a food forest patch. So it's taking the observations of how natural forests work, and it's applying some of those principles when we plant our fruit tree. So it, it becomes very practical. And in this sense, then what you've designed helps take care of itself. And you're not on the hook to go out there and keep maintaining and caring for that tree as you would if you just stuck it in a sea of grass. You know, then then it really needs you. Right. Uh, so 
this this is a way to kind of create a small ecosystem when you're planting a tree or looking at you know you know shaping and growing food in your landscape. It's really a way to help yourself uh, as well as what you're planting. I agree. You know, again, for the listeners' benefit, I had a chance to see you in action or your yard in action in Maryland, and I was, I was impressed when you talked about putting in a fruit tree because we don't often think about companion planting and what would that even look like uh, in the middle of our lawn. So you gave us a very practical example, and I'd love you to go over that with us. Um, select one little fruit tree. What other can, companion plants would go with that and you're talking about a small space right yeah i mean it can be anywhere from a small space so the term food forest uh makes a lot of folks think think uh, of a large scale but really a food forest can be a you know an eight foot by eight foot patch it's really a concept it's uh it's an observation of how healthy forest ecosystems work and you see when you look at a healthy forest there's a lot going on you know you've overstory midstory understory trees shrubs ground covers vines all doing really well together so it's like okay well how do we take that pattern when we are going to plant something on our landscape and obviously we're not going to maybe stack it that intimately but let's put some things together and usually these are perennial plants that you put together they don't have to be but again when you're working you know with perennials like this they 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 do a lot of the ongoing work for you um so yeah so it can be a small eight foot by eight foot patch where the center of that is going to be your fruit tree um now i like to work with what are sometimes called uncommon fruits. Now, uncommon but easy to grow fruits. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Lee Reich uh, and his work. He's he's a wonderful author and a uh, fan of easy to grow and attractive and tasty fruits. And this usually pulls away from the, the common favorites, which can be a little more... Uh, time intensive uh, and sometimes more disease prone uh, fruits. Um, you know, I'm thinking in our neck of the woods here that's uh, that's apples, plums, peaches, uh, even pears with fire blight and things in our our area. So you so you choose, mm-hmm. so you choose something different. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So I go. I I grow pawpaws. Uh, I grow June berries. I grow uh, flying dragon citrus down here. I grow jujube trees. I grow a lot of the berries, elderberry, aronia. Uh, a few of the black currants uh, do well where we are. So I work with what's going to thrive. Uh, you know, I kind of design for neglect, <laughs> mm-hmm. and but putting up. Putting in a little bit of design allows you to kind of, you know, design for neglect. And that comes back to, yes, so when we plant our fruit tree, whatever it is, let's go ahead and put in some of the things that it's going to need so that we're not on the hook for bringing it in constantly. So nitrogen, you know, is, is a key element that helps most plants really thrive. So there's a lot of nitrogen-fixing plants out there. They fix it through the air into nodules on their roots. Typically, these are in the leguminous family. And on a small scale, this could be something like, uh, you know, was it false blue indigo? Uh, it could be lupins. You know, it could be these smaller, more attractive, soft perennials that you could put in close proximity to your tree, your fruit tree. So. When I'm planting fruit trees, I will often stick my nitrogen fixers in the same hole as my fruit tree or within one foot of that young tree. And this goes against most people's concepts of spacing. But really, you want this nitrogen fixing shrub or bush right in the root zone of your young fruit tree so that it can begin feeding the root zone. Uh, and then over time, you know, it can phase out. It's really kind of something that's using uh, kind of what you might call an nurse plant, something that's helping your main food producer get going, right? Uh, We have a lot of deer in our area, so I like to work with uh, lead plant, 
uh, its cousin is the false false indigo bush, mm-hmm. and they're woody they're woody perennials that the deer don't like. And I will also put those in close in with my uh, fruit tree roots, with the understanding that I will keep cutting them back if they start to get too big. If they start to crowd out my fruit tree, I'll just, you know, what we call in permaculture, chop and drop. Hmm. And that way I'm also planting my mulch where I need it. So it's a combination of nitrogen fixing and mulching in one go. And it's right there where I need it. So I'm not going and hauling this or that. I'm not hauling in nutrients. I'm not hauling in mulch. I've planted it right where I need it. So in my case, where I have actually a couple of acres of of food forest, you know, multiple fruit trees and lots of things going on, I can move through those couple of acres within, you know, half an hour to an hour and I can chop and drop and I will have fertilized and mulched, you know, upwards of a couple of acres and be back in my hammock, you know, swinging and enjoying (laughs) myself and not, not still working. And I haven't, you know, had to go buy materials and it really... You know, when you combine the plants, uh, you really reduce the input, uh, both both you know physically and, and monetarily. Um, so, in that same vein, I also like to plant mulch plants, things that will create a living mulch, will ground cover for me in the sense that they will help hold that moisture and build the soil and keep out a lot of the plants that I don't really want growing in there because that means I'll have to maintain it more. Uh, and one of my favorites, uh, well, I have quite a few favorites, um, mints in general I like because they're such amazing pollinators and they make great mint and juleps. I want to interrupt you here. I have to say that you had everybody's jaw dropping when we saw your land and we saw all the mint around and how you inspired us to say mints are great for chopping and dropping no matter where they show up. Yes. Now, of course, it's a very small landscape. You you might uh, you might you might want to go with a a mint that stays put a little more, and that could be you know in the mint family you've got bee balm, uh, you've got cat mint, you've got lemon balm. You know, a lot of these characters that might be a little easier to manage than than say a spreading mint. Um, but yes. It, all of them are wonderful pollinators. They are all, you know, great biomass. So they're producing a lot of plant material that, yes, you can interject and you can go in there and chop and drop and, and sort of pulse that cycle. But even if you don't, you know, they're going to die back and they're going to create that organic matter, ground cover, habitat for beneficial insects and, you know, lizards and toads. And this all adds up to also balancing the insect ecology in your landscape. So having perennials in your landscape constantly, uh, you know, you know, helps create uh, a lot of different types of balances. So uh, another so, so another one of my favorites is running comfrey. So a lot of people are familiar with a standing comfrey, but there are there are running comfreys. So they're spreading comfreys. And again, great pollinator. Great soil builder, also medicinal that you can harvest and use yourself. So just know that there are other types of comfries to find out there. And I use them because, again, I've got a couple of acres. I need help out there. So I get these guys going around my trees, and they really do most of the care for me. And if I want to plant another type of, you know, fruit bush or something in there, I, you know, I can, I can do that above that height typically. So I can get a little bit of that. Uh, overstory, midstory, you know, spaced out, uh, you know, concept there of the food forest. Yeah, and it's amazing to see. I know when we were there, you planted a tree, showed us the mulch, um, showed us how you cut out that square, so to speak, and then you had other plants that you were putting in there. I happen to like wild edibles. That happens to be one of my specialties. And it was neat to see, you know, yarrows there and hyssops uh, and mints that we could cut and take and dry and bring home and use for food, especially through the winter months, um, not to mention delicious, you know, iced teas in the summertime. So that was exciting to me to see the variety of plants that you put around a fruit tree in a small space that, as you said, over and over is, is very helpful because it, it, it cuts down our amount of time we have to tend to everything. 
It, and it just it adds diversity, mm-hmm. and and that's kind of another word for like a little ecosystem, you know, for your tree. So I, I tell I tell folks not to get too worried about you know exactly what these companions might be. Uh, I like for people to plant what they will interact with. So if that's a certain type of herb that you know you will harvest and use, let that be you know one of your companion plants, uh, and and just having. A diversity of plants flowering and again just that insect habitat you know the 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 organic biomass you know pulsing all of this stuff adds to your tree yeah and that's Uh, that's whereas you know it Excuse me, I, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but that's a great teaching because I th- think uh, what I've learned about trees is that you have to be careful, say, putting in patients under a shade tree because they need so much water. That's not good for the root system of the tree. But what you're saying is you're putting plants there that don't need as much water. I- am I hearing you right? Well, I – so backing up a little bit, when I create a patch, I set – the long-term soil building uh, by creating a sheet mulch, um, also known sometimes as like a lasagna garden. So I'm I'm starting out by building up multiple layers of organic matter, whether that's compost, manure, uh, newspaper, cardboard, wood chips, straw, leaves. You know, I'm creating this sort of sponge uh, on top of my, you know, whatever it is, usually lawn or some area that probably does not have great soil, which is what most people are dealing with. And I'll ideally get that started a year before. So I'll I'll say, okay, well, there's the area where I want to put a fruit tree. Let's 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 outline an eight to ten foot you know patch, and let's go ahead now and start layering all these materials on there, and maybe just leave that for the full year. You come back after a year, and that area is beginning to turn into compost, basically. And there's a lot of available nutrients. There's a lot of available moisture. So I'm not so concerned about there being competition for nutrients and water by putting things in close proximity. And again, I'm putting in things that fix nitrogen. I'm, you know, so and and I think in general we do have a we do have a misconception of competition when it comes to plants and yes, when you're looking at the annual garden and yes, there are certain balances to be had, but when you get into these perennial systems, you know, there's a lot of symbiosis that begins to happen and the benefits. And so I think having that ground cover uh, around your trees typically is going to help feed uh, the soil system overall and help your fruit tree. So, I mean, there might be exceptions to that, but generally I would encourage people to, to you know, step away from the concern of, of competition and and Start putting things together, and then it will guide you. You will see and you will learn. Uh, this is an endless journey. You know, when it comes to food forests and, you know, a lot of these designs, there's there's no written set rules for, you know, how you're supposed to do something. Uh, really, the concept is, yes, jump in, start doing it, start observing, and it will teach and guide you. And it's wonderful because then you become part of this ecosystem. Uh, and, and that's there's, a, there's, there's so much to harvest from that. Yeah, I love I love how you tied that all in. Um, again, uh, I'm trying to share a message of holism in all different aspects of life, and we forget that we're a part of it. And I think gardeners in in general tend to know that on some level because they're very connected to their gardens and their plants. They have their passion, their favorites, and they become very good observers. But for those uh, of my listeners who might be uh, beginners or wanting to change something in their yard, I think uh, the way that you described the diversity and the, the perennial systems makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and sometimes you just need to hear it. Uh, I've certainly proved it, and so so have many others who, who work in the holistic permaculture uh, design. This stuff really works, uh, and, and, and it's really just kind of uh, letting go and exploring. Uh, and then, yeah, realizing that you're a key part of this system, and, and that's when it really gets juicy anyway to get out there and get gardening. Uh, but, yeah, when you're new to something and you're looking at a lot of the books – 
which which do kind of come from a separatist standpoint. Uh, a lot of times, you know, teachings come from the university level, and, and they're more scientific, and you, you kind of have to look at the paradigms that the information is coming from, uh, and and feel free to you know to to step away from that. Uh, and really, the main thing is to observe, uh, sort of be unbiased, and see. And tune in, and the plants and the systems will feed you back the information you need. That's really true. They're there to help us, too, on so many different levels, um, and, and they support us in so many different ways. What your your advice and your story and experience is, is, is reminding me, I just interviewed uh, Doug Tallamy, who wrote Bringing Nature Home, and he has a new book out called Nature's Best Hope. But his premise is... Let's look at our front and backyards and add diversity there. And you mentioned how these, this diversity really supports our insect population. And I think right now the insects are really hurting. They've lost habitat and they're getting poisoned uh, from many different sources. So if we can, as homeowners, add something different this year, something else this year into our yard, and as you say, you know, pick something that you really enjoy doing, um, we're going to make a difference collectively in the long run. Yes. Yes. So um, you talk about some of these uh, uncommon fruit trees, and I know you've written another book on pawpaws. How about telling us about uh, your work with that particular fruit? Yeah, so the pawpaw is a fascinating species, a very adaptive species. It's the only member of its family, uh, the custard apple family, which is a tropical and subtropical a uh, family that includes, yes, the custard apple, uh, the sour stop, the cherimoya. Anyway, the pawpaw at some point, you know, how many millenniums ago, I don't know, began to travel north uh, from the tropics. It sort of sliced off of the family and started traveling in the guts of giant mastodons and sloths and came came on the receding glaciers all the way up to southern Canada, Ontario. And adapted, you know, constantly to this changing environment to where we now have a tropical fruit tree that grows in the north. There's nothing else like it. It is a phenomenal uh, species in many ways, and the fruit is exquisite. So when you find the improved genetics, um, you know, some of the best of the of the fruit of the pawpaw. It's up there with some of some of the most delicious fruits in the world. It, it is so. The description is that it's it's custard like. Uh-huh. It it has flavors of banana, mango, pineapple, uh, and and you can get fruits as you know upwards of two pounds in size. So like a very large mango, uh, and it's it's like dessert. It's very rich. It's very creamy. It's like it's like nature's dessert. How and cool very is nutritious. That? Yeah, how cool is that? Yeah. How cool is that? It is. It's very it's very different than any other fruits. Um, and, and the reason that we're not more familiar with it commercially is that it's it uh, has a very short shelf life. Uh, so it's it's quite perishable, uh, which is another reason to grow it yourself. Now it'll grow it'll grow up into zone five, but it, it likes a warm summer to ripen its fruits. So there in Connecticut uh, if you had a bit of a microclimate uh, where you know things stayed a little bit warmer, I would encourage you to try pawpaws. They're very ornamental as well. So even without the fruit, the the tree is is beautiful. Uh, we're talking large, low, deep green leaves that aren't really troubled by insects or disease. In full sun, and pawpaws do grow in full sun. So this is another thing most people think about pawpaws is that it's an understory. Uh, tree or multi-stem shrub in the woods. And yes, it, it grows there. But remember, we're talking about a very adaptive species. So you can bring it out into full sun and it takes on this beautiful pyramid shaped tree, you know, maybe 12, 15 feet tall. Uh, and they can be spaced only 12 feet apart. So even in a smaller landscape, you can get a pair of pawpaws tucked onto the side or in the back and, you know, they'll cross pollinate. Or you can go out there and easily help pollinate them, and then you can have some of the most, you know, exotic 
fruit, you know, <laughs> in the north. In the neighborhood uh, too. <laughs> in the neighborhood, in your yard, they're great. They're great conversation pieces. They make delicious ice cream. So the trick to their perishability is just to pulp them, and the pulp freezes really well. Uh, sometimes for up to two years. So you can take it out and put it in smoothies. Makes great jams. Uh, really exquisite. I have a lot of recipes uh, in my new pawpaw book as well. Uh, and it makes great wine if you're if you're a talented winemaker. The pawpaw wine or pawpaw mead is exquisite. Mm, how about that? I know it's nothing that we talk about too much up here in the Northeast in the Master Gardener programs, uh, but I believe there was one in when I lived in Virginia. There was one in uh, the, one of the Master Gardener gar, you know demonstration gardens down there. Uh, what a great plant, and you become quite a ambassador getting it into our gardens. Yes, I love it. We have a pawpaw festival as well down here in Maryland, uh, usually the third Saturday in September. So if anyone's traveling or wants to come on down, we, we celebrate all things pawpaw here on our homestead. And it's kind of an open house to come and see, yes, you know, our food forests, our gardens that are designed on swales, our mushroom growing, our circular straw bale house, and then, of course, pawpaws and tours ice cream, music. It's its a lot of fun. Oh, I bet it is. I'm going to see if I can plan a trip down there at that time of the year. <clears throat> I'd love Great. to do that. Yeah. Well, uh, what I'd like you to do um, before we conclude is to give our listeners uh, three practical tips. You know, mm-hmm. we're talking about a holistic concept here. We're talking about diversity. If you want to sum it up into three three practical tips for them, I'd appreciate it. Ooh, okay, tricky. Uh, so one I mentioned already is observe. So by and that sounds a little vague, but really observe. Uh, you know what's doing well in your landscape and go with that energy because it's already there. So for me here, pawpaws do grow wild all around me. So I'm like, okay, look, this energy's here. It won't take much when I interact with it to kind of get a lot from it. Uh, that goes for mushrooms as well around here. So, you know, it's moist. We have a lot of woods. Mushrooms are growing well. Okay, it won't take much for me to interact with that energy, and then I'll get lots of shiitakes and oysters and, you know, the things that I enjoy harvesting, but I don't have to put a lot of energy into it. So it's already here, and that's by observation. See what's, see what's doing well and maybe start with some of that energy because you will have success quickly. So observation's good. See how water moves on your landscape and wind. So water and wind are two of the first components that I'm always observing when I'm consulting or you know looking at landscapes. Really observe and work with those up front. I outline you know practical ways to do that in my book uh, as well. So that's one. Uh, two, mulch. Mulch, mulch, mulch. Uh, I don't think folks realize really the extent that is, that, that is very beneficial to mulch. Uh, so for example, when I'm doing a fruit tree patch or something, uh, I will use at least eight inches deep wood chips. Eight inches is like almost a you know a, a starting point for me when I'm mulching an area, especially if I want to transition it. You know, if it's lawn, it's grass, it's some you know weeds, whatever. It's less than ideal soil. Mulch it deeply. So when you go eight inches or more with a mulch, you 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 die off what's underneath. That also begins to build soil. And then you start sponging, you know, moisture, which is what's needed to build those biological, you know, cycles in the soil and bring in, you know, the fungi. So deep mulch uh, in general, mulch well, and then ideally you get a living mulch in place so that you're not maintaining that. Uh, but just mulch, 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 mulch deep, mulch wide. Uh, that'll help the soil, the plants, and you in the long run. Yeah, that's great. Um, very, very practical tips. And again, it kind of, you know, some of the garden stuff says, you know, mulch three inches, but you're saying to do much more than that, and that's much. great for building the soil underneath in the long run. We're not talking about short-term pretty punch in spring. We're talking about maintaining things for the long term. 
Well, we're talking about soil health, and that needs constant feeding. So if you do three inches, really the top inch or two is just protecting that bottom inch, you know, because that top is getting, you know, dry. It's not, it's not really biologically active too much. It's protecting. It's a cap for that inch below, and now that's getting biologically active because it's constantly moist. You need constant moisture for that soil building, right? Mm -hmm. But that will exhaust itself pretty quickly during the summer, and then your soil biota and your fungi are pretty much out of food, so things kind of slow down or stop or die out. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you've got that thick mulch that you know, you've got in place that constant cycle and constant moisture, which will keep your soil biota and fungi pumping, which will keep your plants and everything else pumping. So really it's habitat that you're, you're maintaining. Mm. Great. Again, practical advice for, uh, going forward, especially since spring is here and everybody's getting outside. So, um, Yay. yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. So Michael, what I'd love you to do next is to give us all your contact information, especially not only just the books, but your Papa day. Ah, uh, sure. Yeah. Well, all this is really uh, visible on, on my website, which is ecologia, uh, design.com. Uh, ecologia is a Portuguese word for ecology. And there you'll, you'll a lot of how to on there as well, and of course uh, ways to preview my my books and see about events. We do a lot of hands ons here as well, everything from growing mushrooms and grafting trees to creating food forests. So keep an eye out. Sometimes tours, things like that, opportunities to come visit and see what we're doing. Uh, Facebook, I've got a couple different Facebook pages. Uh, one is Edible Landscaping with a Permaculture Twist. The other one, uh, For the Love of Paul Pauls. Those are both the names of my books. Uh, those are popular Facebook pages. And Instagram, if you're on Instagram, I'm at Permaculture Ninja. And otherwise, yeah, I think that's plenty. Um, oh yeah, that's wonderful. Um, Lots of great um, yeah. ways for us to contact you, ways for people to get your book. Uh, I highly recommend the Edible Landscaping one. I, I refer to it all the time. And again, the pictures that you put in here are so clear and beautiful. They're photographs, and you give a step-by-step -step instruction. So it makes it a great addition to anybody's garden library. Great. Yeah, thanks. I want it to be appealing and, and, and let people know that this can be very attractive as well, because that's important. You know, that's a that's a cultural aspect design that should be in, uh, you know, in realism for people wanting to do this and in areas where that's important. So I, I, I keep that forefront. Mm. Well, all I can say is thank you again, Michael, for joining us here at The Holistic Nature of Us. Yes, thank you for, for keeping The Holistic Nature, you know, shared with all of us. Yeah, and all I can say to my listeners is if you have a chance, go to his website, check out some of his uh, events going on. I highly recommend them. I was very impressed on the tour that you offered a few years ago on, on the property because it, it made everything not only practical, but visual, and it came alive. And I could see what you were doing firsthand. And, it, and I've taken some of that advice and brought it into my own gardens. Great, great. All right. All right, folks. I just want to say thanks again. This is Judith Dreyer. I'm the author of At the Garden's Gate book and blog. My book is available through my website, which is www.judithdreyer.com, as well as several distribution arms, such as Amazon, Nook, Goodreads, and more. I'd like to remind all of you that a transcript is available for each podcast. Please like and share them. Let's support each other and get the word out. And remember, now is the time for practical action and profound interchange so we value our world again. Enjoy your day. <laughs>